Hi everyone. Today I want to talk about a 1962 movie called Harakiri. Uh, this is directed by Masaki Kobayashi. It stars Tatsuya Nakade and um, it is a Criterion Blu-ray release, uh, part of my journey through the filmography of uh, Kobayashi. And this is the first Blu-ray. Um, there's three of them. Um, the first Blu-ray that I'll be talking about. I'm going to just describe briefly the story, some of my reactions to it, uh, the supplements that are contained in this Blu-ray uh, edition, and then maybe talk for a, a minute or two, maybe even a quote from Stephen Prince's book on Kobayashi, A Dream of <clears throat> Resistance. And that is indeed Nakadai on the cover, and that is a scene from Harakiri, and the great uh, sword fight in the grasslands towards the end of the movie. Um, so the, the film is set in 1630. This is 30 years after the Tokugawa shogunate has come to power. They've sort of, uh, um, and they'll be in power for about 250 years. Uh, they've sort of uh, united the country, but they have some of the lords uh, are their allies and some of the lords are their enemies. And they've, the shogunate has broken up these fiefdoms Nakadai plays a, a, um, a samurai who is now let loose with tens of thousands of other samurais because his lord was put into exile. And um, so they roam throughout Japan looking for work. They, they're not trained to do anything other than their sword fighting ability, but again, it's a time of peace. Um, and they, some of them are just in desperate straits, they present themselves to some of these solitary ronin, present themselves to um, to families that, um, clans that are uh, in favor with the shogunate and they, they uh, beg to let them commit harikiri uh, in their courtyard um, as, as uh, this would be a uh, it, it, it would be an honor to them to, to do that in this courtyard. And, and what most of these lords are doing, and they're hoping either to get money or maybe even to get a job rather than to actually commit harakiri. And that sets up the um, sort of the, um, the basis of the story. Um, and Nakadai is a single parent. He has a daughter in the beginning of the film. She's about 11, and she um, and he's also in charge of uh, his best friend's uh, son. He's played by Akira Ishihama, and he was in. He played the teenager in um, Kobayashi's first movie, Sincerity. And they eventually get married. The his ward and his his daughter, but they never recover any kind of, of uh, financial stability. Disease comes, desperation comes to this this family. And what we get in in this storyline and in in uh, Kobayashi's presentation is a very stark black and white widescreen expressionistic. Uh, Kobayashi is deliberately leaving realism behind. It's, he, um, he pairs everything down to, to only what is necessary. He, he's, so he's very much uh, into now stylizing his movie with a kind of uh, uh, a, a design that's very precise. Everything contributes to the storyline. Every every uh, location, every um, character. There's no extraneous characters in this movie. And it's a movie that's full of dialogue. It's a dialogue between first uh, the son, the uh, son-in-law played by Ishihama, and the counselor, Chamberlain counselor of, of, the, um, of, a, of a clan, the, I'm not, I'm not pronouncing it right, I'm sure, Igi, E clan, a very prominent clan, and it's a dialogue between uh, both um, 
uh, Ichihama in this counselor, and then later Nakadai himself in this counselor. In fact, the movie begins with Nakadai's uh, dialogues with this counselor. So the film becomes basically a flashback. And as uh, in the extras, we see uh, uh, a conversation with Shinoba Hashimoto, the screenwriter, and he said, I hate flashbacks. He said, all screenwriters, all directors hate flashbacks. But he said, the flashbacks here are really the story. So it's a forward motion flashback. We're not flashbacking into certain moments in time. It, it, it is the actual story. And it, this is also Kobe Ashley's first movie that he, in which he confronts the past, uh, the feudal past. And, and although his, his themes are basically the effect of World War II, the pre-war militarism of the, um, of the military uh, that was uh, ruling Japan and brought it into the war, he, he relates that to the, the Shido Code of, uh, of these feudal times, uh, and, it's, and particularly the, the immersion of the self into this kind of authoritarian power where you just follow orders, you just do what you're told, you're, you just, you just uh, abandon your individuality, your conscience, and obedience to the authoritarian power. So this military regime, Kobayashi believes, went back to this Bushido code of, um, of feudal times in, in, in Japan. Um, and of course, he sees this this code and the, these clans as as basically a facade. They're empty. They're they're uh, opposed to any kind of human concerns. It's all about the structure, uh, the the institution, um, and and that has to be preserved above all. Um, and and I think the other aspect of this film that really struck me is, is the performance of Nakadai. It, it's just absolutely fantastic. Um, he was only 30 years old in 1962. He had appeared in Kobayashi movies and other movies. He was a veteran actor, but he didn't think he could play 50, which is the character he's playing in Harakiri. Um, uh, he, um, he thought of Mifune, this was a role, why don't you want Mifune to play it? But Kobayashi loved Nakadai. And and he, his transformation uh, into into a 50-year-old is quite convincing. And he draws on the power of his. He says, "I went deep down into my stomach to get this voice that he needed." And of course, he has some of the most piercing eyes of all time. And really, he's he's hard to recognize in this role, but he's absolutely magnificent. This is. We're seeing just to see Nakadai at his best. So let's get to the supplements in this Criterion Blu-ray uh, collection, uh, the this collection of supplements in this Blu-ray release. First of all, there's a video introduction by Donald Ritchie, and it's very good. I mean, Ritchie is really the uh, you know one of the most eminent uh, 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 historians of Japanese cinema, and he was the uh, he was the instigator of Stephen Prince's book because he encouraged, Prince had wrote a book on Kurosawa, I believe, and, and Richie said, do another one, do another one. But it's not an introduction, it's an afterword. Do not watch this before you see the movie. It, it's just an essay on the movie. It's not, I don't know why they call these things introductions. They do this in novels too, where they give you the introduction and it basically tells you the whole story. But then we get an interview with Kobayashi uh, that was uh, with another great director, Masahiro Shinoda. Um, and this is on the Criterion Channel. Harakiri is on the Criterion Channel as well. And it's a good interview. Uh, Shinoda, basically it's all Shinoda talking and Kobayashi has a sentence every now and again. But it's pretty interesting nevertheless to see how Shinoda was influenced in um, his, his own personal reactions to Harakiri, which is, was an amazingly powerful movie uh, in the culture of 1962. The movie went to Cannes Film Festival 
and was it was very uh, I, now I have to say there's a gruesome scene in in Harikiri and um, yeah, I had to look away uh, and it I mean it's just it's it's pretty overwhelming to me now I know if you're a horror film fan you this is you know like mother's milk to you but uh, I still I still have to turn away from gruesome scenes and at Cannes Film Festival it got booed this this scene and 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 there were screams from some of the women in the audience although the film eventually the humanity of the film came through so at the end it got a very positive reaction um, at Cannes it didn't win the Palme d'Or it was thought to be uh, it was thought that it, it might, but it lost to Visconti's um, uh, The Leopard. Uh, but it did win, the, I think it's called the Grand Jury Award, the, like the second, second best. But it was the first trip that, um, that Kobayashi made to Europe. And so he traveled, he, after the festival, he and Nakadai traveled throughout uh, Europe for about six, eight weeks. And uh, he even went to Sweden, he met Ingmar Bergman. And then there's an uh, interview with Shinobu Hashimoto, and Hashimoto is um, the screenwriter, and, uh, and he was a very famous and very successful screenwriter. He had written Rashomon, Seven Samurai, Kiru, Bad Sleep Well for Kurosawa. I mean, he was, he was one of the um, preeminent screenwriters. Uh, he was always, he says in this interview, he was always uh, very much... Um, uh, interested, fascinated by the whole uh, process of how you commit Hari <laughs> Kiri. So he actually demonstrates, you know, the different ways to do it. And, um, uh, and then an interview uh, with uh, Nakadai himself. And, and th this is a great interview, Nakadai is. Uh, n these interviews are all, I guess, for the DVD, which was earlier in the 2000s. Um, and Nakadai is a fantastic interview, uh, uh, so much great information about Harikiri, about Kobayashi. Um, the swords, they used real swords in these sword fights, so they were heavy. And Nakadai said you couldn't do the kind of slash, slashing that uh, Mifuni would do in his samurai, some of his samurai scenes, uh, battle scenes, sword fights and other samurai movies where, you know, it's like a, a feather there. He said, this, this, th these were tiring and they had, uh, the sword fights are slow. This, this great sword fight that's out in the grasslands that this picture is from, that uh, involved, he, it was a one-on-one -on -one sword fight. And the actor who was playing uh, his opponent, uh, a very recognizable uh, actor who's been in a lot of uh, uh, Japanese films and samurai films because he was an expert swordsman. And not that I said he was an expert in anything, everything he, he, he had many interests and he was an expert in all of them, including being very fluent in English. And, uh, you know, and not that I said, I was scared. I mean, you know, these are real swords he's, he's swinging at me. He says, you know, what if he's swinging at my head? And the, the, and the other actor said, well, you're going to have to duck. <laughs> and, but it makes the realism of, of the, um, the authenticity of the sword fight much more striking, especially if you're used to the, to the, uh, the kind of sword fights that you normally see in samurai movies. Um, he also says that um, when he approaches the role in any Kobayashi movie, he says, well, what do you want me to do? You know, it goes, Kobayashi says, I'll leave that up to you. You decide what to do. <laughs> and that was the, the kind of relationship. He had such faith in that, that Nakadai, who was, who was just, um, who would just immerse himself in a kind of method acting into his parts. And so Kobayashi was quite confident that whatever Nakadai came up with, uh, it, would, it, it would be something special. So then we have a, uh, we have a nice little booklet, and this booklet has a uh, essay by Joan Mellon, and she has also written quite a few books on Japanese cinema. It's far too short. It's far too short. Uh, that's another picture from the Grassland sword fight. Um, it's far too short an essay, uh, but 
it's packed with information. And then maybe the best, the best uh, supplement on this uh, Criterion Blu-ray release is an interview with Kobayashi himself. And that's, I think that's the only picture they have of Kobayashi in this whole booklet and, and, um, and on the physical packaging. And that was his trademark hat. This is also fantastic. And he talks about his idea of, of evil and human beings and the kind of original sin, as I said in other, um, in other videos of, uh, that I made on this Kobayashi journey. Uh, he, he very much is into, um, into uh, a kind of Christian spiritual um, ideas um, and uh, as, as well as his uh, immersion in Buddhist art uh, his his uh, ment his his um, uh, movie mentor was uh, Kisuke Kinoshita at uh, Soshiko Studios, but his uh, his mentor in art in Buddhist art, of which Kobayashi was was uh, was very interested in, was a, a poet by the name of Yashi Ezu, and and and. Uh, uh, and Kobayashi says whenever he made a film, he was always thinking that it'll, it's, it'll be a good film if I, if I satisfy either Kinoshito or Aizu and or. <laughs> um, and it's funny because Kinoshito uh, refused to see Harakiri. Um, he heard about how the cruel scene in it, uh, the gruesome scene. And the movie was thought by many to be ex excessively cruel. But then about 10 years later, they were at a memorial service for somebody that they both known, and Kinoshito came up to Kobayashi, and he said, you know, they, they showed Harakiri on television the other night, and I watched it. Great film, he said, in Kobayashi, uh, much to Kobayashi's pleasure. But this original sin, um, it, how, it, how does the individual, the individual is always up in Kobayashi's movies, and his philosophy, up, you're always up against the historical forces in which you live and the oppressive forces, the, the feudal power in, the, in Harakiri. And how do, you, how do you overcome the tragic elements of that to, to maintain your individual, individuality or conscience within, um, within that, um, that framework? Of, of the oppressive regimes, feudal regimes, the Bushido Code, um, and the, and I, I before I get to Steve, I, I want to read a quote from uh, from Stephen Prince's book. But uh, before I get to that, the the music in Hari Kiri is is outstanding, and this is uh, I think is Kobayashi's second movie with Toro Takamitsu, and he did he did uh, uh, the music. I believe in the inheritance as well, and he was just one of the great musicians, composers in 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 Japan. Uh, he even did a uh, concert in New York uh, with the Philharmonic using an instrument called biwa, B I W A. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. I apologize. And this was uh, a generic name given given to a. a uh, um, a, a bunch of lutes, L-U-T-E. Uh, he didn't, Takamitsu did not want to use the biwa because uh, it was so associated with the military regime in the 1930s. Uh, but then by the 1960s, he sort of discovered it and he uses this, these instruments, these lutes throughout, um, throughout the Harakiri uh, to fantastic effect. And again, Kobayashi, a great admirer of Takamatsu said, you know, just do what you want. And he basically did not just the music, but the whole sound design. Every sound in the movie, just as the visuals are all precise, the design of the movie is precise, so is the music, the sound, every sound, whether it's the sound of a fan whirring through space or, a, or a, 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 you know, a bird or anything. It, it's all, it's all, uh, put in there for for a purpose, for an emotion, or to ex accent an emotion. So I'll close with a, uh, and I apologize as always for the length of this one, but I, I just wanted to 
because this is such a bleak movie that um, you might lose sight of Kobayashi's spirituality um, and his openness to spirituality. And this is from Stephen Prince's um, book. Uh, through, his, through this openness to spirituality, Kobayashi points at values and experiences that are trans-historical and lie outside of time itself. If history is a tragic, often brutalizing experience, the vertical dimension, a sense of the sacred, counters this by pointing beyond time in a manner that affirms the dignity and worth of existence. Kobayashi's sensitivity to sacrality enables him to surmount the tragic vision of history that his work often portrays and to offer in the midst of negativity a redemptive, a redemptive portrait of life. I, I can't paraphrase that <laughs> and say anything as, as, uh, as uh, to the point as Stephen Prince. So I'll close with that. Um, again, thanks for everybody who stuck with me uh, to the end. Uh, uh, you guys take care, and I will catch you next time.